Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chatham House. Welcome to our discussion today called Ending the russo ukraine War, Scenarios and Consequences. Uh, my name is Risa Lutsevich. I am the head of Ukraine Forum and Deputy Director of Russia and Eurasia Program here in Chatham House. We are on the record today. Uh, we have an amazing audience here in the house, but also quite a lot of participants online. Um, so we are also live streaming this event, and you can later share the recording. And feel free to share the information you hear today using a hashtag CHEvents. So uh, this is um, 733rd day of a full-scale invasion and now nearly 10 years of the Russia's attack on Ukraine that started with the annexation of Crimea. And uh, there is a saying in Ukraine that um, if there is... Um, if Russia stops fighting, there is no war. But if Ukraine stops fighting, there is no Ukraine. Uh, today we are where we are. There is still war and there is still Ukraine. And we are in this precarious moment of, of um, this dangerous confrontation. And I'm joined by an amazing Chatham House home team. This is all our experts. And um, I'll introduce them as they are sitting next to me. To my left is uh, James Nixie, the director of Russian Eurasia program. Next to James is Natalie Sabanadze. She is our senior fellow in Russia and Eurasia program. Patricia Lewis is the director of International Security Program. And last but not least is um, Kir Giles, senior consulting fellow at the um, Russia and Eurasia program. So we've, we decided to um, share our thoughts and um, our um, analysis um, about uh, where we are at this war. Um, we had an internal meeting under the famous Chatham House rule on the 29th of January to discuss possible scenarios where this war may go um, and what are the consequences of uh, these different pathways. Because <coughs> honestly, you could say we are at a certain crossroad uh, in this war. Um, some of this analysis is now uh, publicly available on Chatham House website. James Nixie wrote an expert comment called a long, uh, a long War Works Against Ukraine and the West on Security. You can, you can find and read it. But now we don't have to read. We can hear James. <laughs> and, and I would like to bring it straight away to him. Um, by would like to ask James to share the evolution of this war. What, what kind of war is it? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the current state, both on the battlefield and, and politically? James. Right. Thanks very much, Arisia. Thank you, everybody. Um, nice to see you all here. Um, so this war, uh, is it, you can hear me. My microphone's on, yeah? OK, um, it's not clear. Um, <clears throat> it was a long time in the making. Um, and it happened because because Vladimir Putin told us how he saw the world, and, and we saw it differently. But we didn't tell him that we saw it differently. Um, and I don't mean to sound too much as if I'm blaming the West, but in a very specific sense, I, I am. But Putin was quite clear multiple times, not least in Munich in 2007, that he saw the post-Soviet space at the very minimum to be under Russia's supervision. And we thought we could square that circle. We smiled, did deal, shook hands, created for a, uh, for, for, for discussion. We constantly looked at prospects for cooperation. But we did ignore Russia's howls of protest um, that, in its words, we didn't respect its security concerns. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to be clear, I don't mean that we should have listened to him as in we should have acceded to his requests come demands. I mean that we should have listened to him and clearly communicated that those demands would never be acceded to, um, and that we saw Ukraine as a real country, um, and that would never be any concession to Russia's demand that it has privileged rights. Instead, we ignored that most difficult problem. We engaged in false resets, which were never going to work, um, <clears throat> and which encouraged Putin to, to carry on encroaching. Um, <clears throat> So, and we, we said to ourselves, oh, it's just what Russia does. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's Russia being Russia. And so Putin, therefore, tested the waters in 2008, in 2014, and he found the West to be pretty, pretty accommodating. But it still, it still wasn't enough for him. Um, he wanted, either it was going too slowly or, or he, didn't, he needed some sort of official recognition or, or affirmation. Um, and so he offered us then a couple of draft treaties or draft agreements, um, which were actually ultimata. 
And they demanded, of course, no enlargement, no NATO enlargement, um, especially for Ukraine, um, <clears throat> and no NATO forces uh, in the countries which had joined NATO after 1997. Um, <clears throat> so you can make an argument, I think, that those proposals were designed to fail, but they were certainly impossible to accept. And so, to sum up, I suppose, the war happened because we disagreed at the most fundamental of levels, and Putin wasn't prepared to live with just agreeing to disagree as we were. So that's, that's, that's how I see this war as having, having started. Now, in terms of where we are right now, sort of a second part to your question. Um, look, long wars ebb and flow in terms of who has the upper hand. Um, <clears throat> at this point, it has to be said that as far as the front line on the land is concerned, uh, Russia has a sort of a triple advantage right now in terms of ammunition, personnel, and uh, military industrial capacity. And so therefore the Kremlin does seem to feel that it can prevail in a war of attrition. No matter who is president in America, I must say, Trump may be preferable, but Biden will do perfectly well. Um, <clears throat> after all, there's little difference for Ukraine between a president who can't provide the funding and a president who won't provide the funding, as for Ukraine anyway. Might be a difference for us, but not for Ukraine. Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, and, it, and it shouldn't, I just, I suppose it shouldn't surprise us that uh, although Ukraine has recovered large swathes of territory, that the remaining 18% uh, is the hardest to, to, to regain. Um, <clears throat> but it has to be said, though, that had the West provided Ukraine with the weapons that the country's leadership had requested at the beginning, um, missile defense systems, long range missiles, fighter jets, tanks, then it's, it's very conceivable that the war would, might look a lot different now. And so I suppose because Russia has some sort of tactical advantage right now, um, there and, some, and some recent successes, you do hear more voices saying that Ukraine must sue for peace right now. But that surely is an argument that the Kremlin is perfectly happy with. Um, and that's why I think it's very hard to countenance that sort of idea at this, at this stage. Um, <clears throat> I certainly think it's what the Ukrainians are more afraid of than anything else that they are being forced into some form of a negotiation, of being let down again as they've seen themselves and others, notably Georgia in the past. So, and it's also, when all the indications are that the Kremlin is hell-bent on decapitating the Ukrainian leadership, Medvedev was tweeting just today about wouldn't stop until you, Kiev has fallen and uh, death is a Russian, uh, a Russian city, um, <clears throat> then I, I think, uh, you know, it is, it, it is a, the sure, Ultimately, it's, uh, it's a myth to say uh, that Ukraine can't win. But, this is what I'll end on, absent renewed financial and legal aid uh, and, and lethal aid assistance, then um, the darker scenario, which is actually almost any other scenario of a Ukrainian victory, um, is actually perfectly plausible. Thank you, Jane. I mean, you, you mentioned the word, the war of attrition or attrition, and it's interesting to think whether this is a scenario that Putin wants to impose, the kind of dy dynamic in this war where he believes, you know, representing or running Russia as an um, authoritarian system, he can marshal those resources while he, here in the West, all the pressures of public opinion and domestic politics can actually weaken that alliance that um, the Rammstein group and, and the assistant that Ukraine uh, had that underpinned a lot of Ukrainian military successes in 2023. So thanks for bringing them in and also giving us a bit of a telescopic view on how we ended up where we are. So now we would like to bring in on to Natalie and um, um, to look at um, an important theater of war, which is the Black Sea, because that's where the war started from the Black Sea. There has been a lot of you know, movement in there, uh, unlike perhaps on the land frontier. Uh, and uh, just before that meeting we had in Chatham House, I mentioned, on the 29th of January, and, and today there has been, you know, another A-50 radar plane shot over Russia that kind of complicates its air control over Ukraine. So um, where are we now on the Black Sea, and, and why do you think that is important for this war? Thank you, Arisia. It's a bit difficult to squeeze the entire region in five minutes, but I will uh, do my best. Um, the future of Black Sea as a region, wider region, very much depends on what will happen in Ukraine and how this war will unfold. Um, if I were to single out some characteristics uh, of this area before the war, I would say 
Um, it was characterized by variable geometry, which is often referred to because you have all sorts of different players. You have three NATO members, uh, three EU members, um, NATO members, EU members, you have Russia, you have aspirants. So it was a very fragmented uh, region. It was also very much characterized um, by a Turkish-Russian frenemosity, which is both friendship and animosity, depending on circumstances. Um, Russia's power assertion, security deficit, and Western neglect. And that was before, um, before the invasion. All those characteristics are still there, except for the Western neglect. So it becomes a real area of contestation now uh, with Russia. For Russia, historically, this has been extremely important, Black Sea, for its self-perception of a great power. Uh, and uh, for Putin in particular, if you recall his speech uh, 10 years ago, the Crimea's annexation, he stated that Crimea is very much part of the Russian identity, Russian heritage, and this is where Russia's renaissance, this kind of new modern revival will uh, begin. Um, and he says that when um, Russia basically lost Crimea because it became uh, part of another state, Ukraine, which had a strange idea of wanting to be sovereign, Russia was robbed. And then it was too weak to respond, and now it was um, getting what it belongs to Russia rightfully. So this is the approach that Russia has to Crimea. But in that speech, it also mentions that Crimea is not enough. Uh, it's the entire south and east of Ukraine, because alone Crimea is uh, not viable. So ideally for Russia, uh, what they would want is to cut Ukraine off of the Black Sea, uh, take Odessa, which would cripple Ukraine economically and also uh, provide access to uh, Transnistria. Uh, however, the plan is stalling, and it is stalling because Ukraine is having surprising naval success uh, for the country that has no navy. It has managed to, um, to launch a pretty effective and successful asymmetric operation against a much more powerful uh, uh, rival, an enemy, uh, and uh, a lot of military assist, uh, analysts are now looking at the use of drones. Uh, very simple, basically boats that are packed with uh, explosives that have been used so effectively. And how this is going to change the, um, the conduct, the future conduct of uh, the war. At the moment, what we know, according to various estimates, but uh, according to Ukrainians, 24 warships have been sunk. Uh, one submarine that is one third of the Russian fleet, and Russian fleet is kind of retreating to safer harbors. Uh, and one potential such harbor is in the occupied Georgia's region, Abkhazia, in Ochamchire. Uh, this is a very small harbor that Russia has been controlling since 2009. At the moment, it's uh, not deep enough, it's only nine meters of uh, depth and can only. Um, harbor uh, petrol boats, basically. However, the construction seems to have begun, uh, at least the images demonstrate that, and the Russians have declared that this year, in 2024, it should be operational. Um, this is, uh, of course, very important <coughs> because it brings, kind of expands the theater of conflict and brings uh, Georgia in, Abkhazia is, uh, uh, occupied by Russia, but the Ura it is Georgia. And if Russia is going to use that base to attack Ukraine, then obviously Georgian territory becomes a legitimate target for Ukrainian retaliation. So uh, uh, as a potential escalation uh, can take place there or expansion of the theater. Um, another kind of statelet, which is there also creation of Russia, is uh, Transnistria, which is part uh, of Moldova. As long as Odessa stands, there is a separation. However, if there is a, uh, an unfortunate scenario and Russia manages to um, fulfill its plan, then obviously Transnistria becomes incredibly vulnerable. There is no reason for Transnistria to remain separate. Uh, there are some movements now already. Uh, uh, we'll see, we can discuss it later. 
um, and Moldova will be destabilized, of course, and now I'm just quickly moving into the scenarios. Moldova um, will be destabilized, uh, so will Georgia, uh, and, and the influence of Russia will increase irrespective of the candidate status, I think, there. With Moldova's destabilization, I think Romania becomes very vulnerable, and we are always talking about sort of Baltic states and Poland being at the forefront, but in this case, I think we also have to watch uh, Romania. And uh, if, for instance, Odessa is taken, then Russia, the Romanian-speaking minorities become under Russian jurisdiction, and that could be a potential for um, provocation. Uh, and just to uh, finish, in principle, uh, if Russia succeeds, then uh, Black Sea for Russia would fulfill its initial function, what it wants Russia to do, which is to use it for the power projection further, particularly in Eastern Mediterranean and Western Balkans, and there there will be lots of opportunities to put pressure on Europe through, for example, migration through Eastern Mediterranean and also creating this kind of axis of hybrid regimes uh, in Western Balkans and scenarios could look quite, um, quite challenging for uh, Europe and European security. Thanks, Natalie, and I think it's important to recall that story because it often goes unnoticed with more with the focus on the land war and how, if you remember at the beginning, it was uh, almost, uh, you know, the, the considered um, too escalatory to attack Crimea since the start of the war where there were fears of how Putin will retaliate if this happens. But as we see, Ukrainians have successfully pushed Russians and destroyed quite a lot of airfields and airplanes on the peninsula itself. And most importantly, not just for Ukraine's economy, but for global food security, are now able to use the trade routes and uh, to build sustainability of Ukraine's own uh, you know, revenue base to finance the war, because that Black Sea is so important um, for, uh, for Ukraine's economy. Thanks for bringing it in. And um, I'd like to now invite Patricia. You know, there's been a lot in the news, obviously, about the stalemate, about the deadlock. Uh, you know, and now even again, between that meeting we had in Chatham House and today, uh, Ukrainians said to leave Avdiivka. There is quite serious Russian push from the north around Kharkiv, but they are they, they feel like they're on the winning trajectory, um, but whereas U.S. support is not coming, the ratio to uh, artillery, uh, uh, the deficit, and Ukraine is starving in artillery. And we may see, eventually, uh, some kind of a ceasefire agreement if Ukraine is not able to sustain, you know, the, the, the war. So if, if and this is a hypothetical scenario, of course, we are discussing. If we see that happening, how should we in the West, and not from Ukraine's perspective, I think that's important, to interpret such a um, um, whether, uh, I mean, I would say intermediate war ending, uh, and what are the likely consequences of such um, event? Thanks, Aresia. I mean, it's, this is a very difficult thing to discuss. Um, and I think it's really important that you know, in, in, in putting this forward, I'm not advocating this position. Um, but I do think we need to think it through. Um, I think the most important thing is that there should be no forcing of Ukraine into anything. Having said that, of course, Ukraine was forced into the war by Russia, right? This is not Ukraine's uh, wish. Yeah, it's not Ukraine's wish to be, to be at, uh, at war. Um, so I think it's really important that, that we see this as thinking these things through for, for two purposes. One is um, to, to, if you like, head the possibilities off at the pass, to, to think about what might come out of such a negotiation, if such a negotiation were to come, and to think about the best ways in which we could support Ukraine. Um, and that, that would be if Ukraine wanted to do this. And then the other would be um, to, uh, to think through about how to think about the longer term future as well. So in that, I would say that we cannot trust, we cannot build trust into this, uh, any negotiation. There have been so many broken agreements uh, by Russia and by others, but by Russia particularly in this case. Um, and so what we have to do is if we, if, if Ukraine wants to go down a ceasefire or a peace agreement approach, we have to build it without trust. We have to build an agreement that does not take trust into account. Um, so in other words, it's resilient 
to the breaking of trust. And that's not easy, but it's actually, it's a much better approach, I think, than a lot of the treaty negotiations that, that we do already. So what I would say is that if, if, um, if, if President Zelensky and, and his um, government, um, they've got a really delicate problem because in all negotiations, when you're winning, you don't want to negotiate. <coughs> when you're losing, that's the worst time for you to negotiate. Because when you're winning, you can at least play from a point of view of strength. When you're losing, you're, you're at the mercy of the other. And finding that optimum sweet spot, because you know, you've got to get both sides to negotiate, is when both sides realize, essentially, that they're either heading into a very long attrition war or a stalemate in which neither side can really win. And that's the point at which you get a genuine negotiation. right? So that's really important to, to notice. And I think that there are so many factors coming up. And there's always this you know, tendency to say, oh, well, you know, well, let's wait and see what happens with this. But I think the big one is, will be the US elections. It's hard enough now with a president and administration that supports Ukraine if we were to move into another type of US administration in which that support could not be taken for granted and that we might see more support for Russia. We could. We, um, President Lenski could end up in a really difficult position, and, and, and Putin knows that, right? So this is where I think the delicate balance of pain and gain uh, has to be really thought through. So I think there are, there are, there are uh, several types of deals that could be done. The most likely, it seems to me, is what we would call a ceasefire or a pause, and we, we've all heard about that in the context of many things. But you can have very long-term ceasefires. Um, the good thing about ceasefires, of course, is that you're not essentially negotiating a treaty. You're giving a pause, perhaps to negotiate a peace settlement later on, uh, perhaps to rearm, of course, on both sides, uh, perhaps to wait to see what happens with different political arrangements and, and diff different events as time goes forward. And we can think of one very long ceasefire from the early 1950s on the Korean Peninsula. But, you know, it's held, mostly. I mean, there's bits of firing across it, etc. but... Uh, compared with what a, a full-out war, it's been, um, in that sense, successful. But it's never led to a peace treaty. It's never led to, to an agreement. So you could have then, you know, a ceasefire and then a peace settlement, or you could go straight to a peace settlement. But I think, given all the history, that's unlikely. Um, so if we went for a, a temporary ceasefire, how, how would it be structured? So you could, I think, in a ceasefire, what you wouldn't want to do is cede territory, because that would be much, much bigger negotiation. And that would be um, a, a, a more the terms of a peace settlement. So a ceasefire would essentially freeze the conflict with perhaps a demilitarized zone. That's possible um, in between the two countries. Um, it could be policed. It could be um, um, policed by the UN. It could be policed by European force. It's very difficult to know how that might work, given, given the way Russia behaves and Russia thinks, but it's possible. And, of course, it would be a, a de facto, not an in-law um, uh, uh, borders. So they, wouldn't, they shouldn't be ever set into law as a result of a ceasefire. Um, and it can be done quickly. But, of course, they're very vulnerable to um, uh, breaking. But it, it's not like breaking a treaty. And we've seen Russia break so many treaties now and, and agreements. And, and things... Because of the monitoring and verification, and you can uh, inf enforce a huge amount um, in, a, in a ceasefire, um, you can find out quite quickly when things are, you know, small little uh, transgressions across the border, etc., or whether or not it's, a, it's the beginning of a larger breaking of the ceasefire. Um, and things, of course, can go wrong in a ceasefire by accident, so that has to be factored in. Uh, but they also can go wrong on purpose, and that has to be factored in. Um, you might want to, as a result of a ceasefire, also set up parallel track talks uh, between the US and Russia. Um, also, perhaps, um, all sorts of other parallel track about things like sanctions, etc., which probably would be included in any ceasefire um, agreement. Um, and then I think it's about the long-term vision as to what could be built on from such a, a, a situation, whether or not... Uh, you would see it as just a delay to give some pause in the fighting, to give some regrouping, et cetera, and just think, well, this will, there will be war again. 
and that might be one way to think about it, and it might be a realistic way to think about it, or it might be that because of external political factors, it starts to look better, and you could start to build on it in a different way. So I think that it's really about um, the issue of preparation for all eventualities that we need to think about this. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that we... Obviously, we would want Ukraine to win. But if Ukraine wants to go for a ceasefire, we have to think about how we can support them and how it will help European security in the longer run. Thanks, Patricia. And it's, it's important that you brought in the trust part. And I was thinking that, of course, Ukrainians have no trust vis-a-vis -vis Russians because of the history of Minsk agreements and protocols and more than 200 rounds of negotiations, when at that time ceasefire wasn't holding. But also, I think, deep down, Ukrainians also mistrust the West with the history of the mm -hmm. Budapest Memorandum, but also what the West did after the Minsk protocols, when there was that moment to perhaps really deter Russia from another invasion, where Whereas that didn't happen, but um, important, you know, kind of, uh, it's important to understand how that could work, whether this could work with Russia, whether this could work with this particular man in charge of Russia, all these questions are, are remain open. And also, I think the internal domestic drivers of that, right, are important. U.S., you mentioned, but also Russia internally, there's been a death of Navalny again recently since we, <laughs> since we met, thinking of a scenario that wasn't the case, now he's dead, and also uh, Ukraine own, um, um, Ukraine's own consolidation of resources to mobilize for the victory Ukraine wants to see. Lots of these internal so, questions open. What I would say is that post-2014 um, and, and then post-2022, I mean, anyone who doesn't recognize what President Putin is and what President Putin and his government is doing is willfully blind, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, d I think that there is, there is no possibility now that it could be misinterpretation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for true. pointing that out. So now I would like to move to Kier and ask him about, given these, I don't know if you agree with me, but that we are in a way at the crossroad of this, of this, of this war. There are different choices that could be made, uh, uh, how this war will evolve, and what are the consequences for the West in this? Because clearly Ukraine has put its standpoint peace plan, as the way Zelensky said, they said this is how we want this war to end. But is Ukraine enabled to win this war this way or end this war this way? And what would you say is at stake for, um, for transatlantic community, NATO, here the UK? Thanks, Zarissia. I'd like to start by picking up on a point that James made about the way this war was long in the making. I was reminded this morning by um, Anna Morgan from the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House that five years ago today, quite a few of us were sitting in this room talking about how Russia was going to behave and what Russia was going to do. It was at the launch of a book called, with subtitle was What Drives Russia to Confront the West? And a large part of the conversation then was effectively a warning, talking about how if all of the issues that James listed were not addressed, we would see another major crisis, another conflict with Russia. And sure enough, three years later, that happened. And I mention that now as a shameless advertisement for the expertise that is concentrated in the Russia and Eurasia program of this building and also a suggestion that from time to time it is worth listening to what that expertise produces in terms of assessments and predictions, even if what they say is unpleasant and inconvenient. But coming to Arisia's question, you, you also asked me earlier what the, the possible range of outcomes would be and what the most desirable ones would be. And during the exercise that gave rise to um, what we are hearing today, we were thinking about different possible scenarios, different possible outcomes to the conflict. And of course, the optimum one is a realization of that 10-point peace plan that's been put forward as long ago as October 2022 by President Zelensky, and what would actually resolve the conflict. And let's not forget, only two of those 10 points are actually to do with territorial control. The rest is about longer-term security, of which Ukraine regaining its sovereign territory is only a small part. Now, obviously, that's the most favorable outcome, but it's always been on the optimistic side. And now it seems to be receding even further because of the interruptions in aid, particularly from the United States. And we don't know how long that interruption in support is going to last. Because even if 
Congress takes its foot off the hose of support for Ukraine. It's going to take time for things to come back online. And the question is, how much will Ukraine lose during that time? And we may, in the long run, be faced with some grim accounting. Who has killed more Ukrainians? Which of Russia's tools has accounted for more death of innocent people? Iranian drones or North Korean shells or US Republicans? So, short of that, there's a spectrum of other possible outcomes. There could be a substantial Ukrainian advance, it's still possible. There could be a ceasefire and a freezing of the conflict. There could be, God forbid, complete defeat of Ukraine with the entire country overrun. All of these things we considered during this exercise. But the question that Arisa posed for me is what exactly should the West do in all of those different situations? Now that, in a way, is one of the easier questions to answer from all of these different variables that we've seen, because what we discovered in this lengthy and detailed discussion was that there is no plausible outcome left that does not absolutely require the maximum possible support to Ukraine, but also massive reinvestment in countries' own defense, and not just the frontline states, but across Europe. So let's consider each of those outcomes in turn. If there's a Ukrainian victory without deep change in Russia, not just a change of leadership, but actually societal change that changes all of the Russian preconceptions about the country and its place in the world, then you have a resentful Russia that continues once again to rebuild its forces to have another go after a certain period of time has elapsed in just the same way that we saw President Putin with his 20-year program of preparing for war. So in that case, Ukrainian victory buys time. It buys time for Europe. It buys time for this belated start to rearmament to meet the threat and giving the opportunity to assure long-term peace by being sufficiently strong, not just in the frontline states, but across Europe, to deter Russia from future aggression. What about the middle ground? What about a ceasefire? Well, in that case, as you heard from Patricia, Ukraine needs the support to defend itself and to make the ceasefire work because there is absolutely zero expectation that Russia will abide by it. So Ukraine needs to make it clear to Russia that there will be consequences for breaking the ceasefire and consequences that Russia will not like. That means, too, massive support for Ukraine and also for the frontline states to ensure that they are not an alternative target. This, too, buys time, but less of it, and it is a race in rearmament between Ukraine and Russia for who can be in a credible defensive position fastest. What about Ukrainian defeat? Then you have Russia that is not only stronger, not only emboldened, not able, not only able to conscript and dragoon into its forces all of those Ukrainians who will be under occupation, but also a Kremlin that is still more convinced that overt aggression is the route to achieving what it still wants. That means that the whole of Europe is at risk. Because let's not forget where President Putin has laid out the boundaries of his ambition. It doesn't stop at Ukraine. It, lay, it overlays countries that are full-fledged members of the EU and NATO, which means if we are allied with them in any way, we too are at risk. So what should be done? What we've noted over the last few months is a disconnect, a complete gap between what military analysts, defense analysts, serious Russia analysts are saying, all pointing to the threat from Russia, but in capital cities west of Warsaw, little action and no urgency to deal with the threat. Now, a few days ago, we had a, a press briefing, a media event here at Chatham House, and uh, I said then that I pointed to the crescendo of warnings that we've had from defense ministers and currently serving military leaders, senior military officers, including here in the UK, about what is coming down the track towards us, but no evidence that the highest political level has understood the scale of the threat or tried to explain it to the public. And I concluded, if action comes too late to avoid disaster, it will have been because of criminal complacency at the highest political level. Now, I stand by that. It is faintly bizarre that we still see charts of NATO members saying which ones have met their pledge to spend 2% of GDP on defense and which have not, as though that was some kind of meaningful metric of defense capacity. It is long past time that that is an obsolete measure of commitment. It was always 
a symbol. It measures input, not output. But now it's a symbol in reverse. Those that have not met the country, uh, the 2% the pledge, should see it as a badge of shame because it is indicative of the lack of statesmanship, the lack of leadership. It's indicative of a nation's refusal to take seriously its duty to safeguard not only its allies, but also its own citizens. So I'll conclude just by saying the conclusion that we arrived at across the board for all of the possible scenario outcomes that we considered was that it is long past time for Europe as a whole to look to its own defense. Thank you. Thank you, Kier. And again, something that did happen between our meeting and today is these bilateral security agreements, agreement on security cooperation that have been signed with the UK, also France, Germany, Canada, Italy and Denmark. So we have a group of countries who are trying to structure some kind of more sustainable security relationship with Ukraine. We can discuss that in Q&A if people are interested, but that's that is something, a new evolution of, of, uh, um, of a situation. So I'd like to uh, bring it back to you, the audience, and also our online audience, um, because there are a lot of questions, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and given how full this room is, I don't want to ask any questions from me. So if you can just raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, I will also do the same with um, people from the, from the um, uh, webinar. So yes, the ladies there, please. If you can just stand up so that we can see you. Hi, I'm um, Phoebe Page, Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, Keir Jazi, we're just talking now about the disconnect between um, the political elites in the West and sort of the serious Russia experts and think tank experts. Uh, and they completely agree and was wondering how you think that disconnect might be best closed <laughs> and if it is possible to close that gap. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll take one question here. Then, yeah, if you if you can, uh, no, uh, somebody, if you can just if address to somebody, it'd be easier because there are four speakers on the panel. If you so, would like to address your question, yeah, Bruno Rosa Rosen Rubini Associates. Um, uh, to Kier, I suppose. So um, a potential deal um, that could be thought of. Um, and of course, it would be damaging for both sides, and that could make it uh, realistic, is that Ukraine gives up 18% of its territory, the one that Russia has conquered, but at the same time, it joins NATO uh, immediately, so that Russia doesn't have an incentive to restart the war uh, a month later or two years later, as it was suggested before. How realistic is that deal? Of course, in, also in light of what potential President Trump said regarding the intervention of, of the U.S. In, in defense of NATO countries in Europe. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take those two for Kieran. One for James that is coming here from the uh, Internet. To what extent we shall take seriously Putin's demands that not NATO pulls back to the borders of 1997 before enlargement? Kieran. Okay, certainly. What would actually close the gap? What would convince Western European leaders that the, the time is now to actually look to their own protection? Sadly, precedent suggests that it is only disaster that will do that because we have had so many incontrovertible indications of what is coming, so many demonstrations of Russia's intent, so many wake-up calls on which this news button has been pressed over the last couple of decades. And what concerns me, particularly thinking about this country, is the, uh, the consistent habit over time of starting wars by losing disastrously before getting its act together at enormous and tragic cost in the lives of good men and women. So I fear that if there has not been anything yet which has convinced people of the urgent and increasingly strident warnings actually being correct about the predictions for what Russia is trying to do, reconstituting its forces, saying it intends to do, then it takes an actual demonstration of the damage that can be done to countries like this one to, to shake our highest political leaders awake. I wish it were not so. On the, the deal where um, Ukraine gives up uh, an area of its territory in exchange for uh, for immediate NATO membership in order that Russia is deterred from taking any more. It's not an implausible suggestion, uh, but of course, it is not something that can be forced on Ukraine. As we've heard so often, it is not something that, uh, that the 
Ukrainian leadership and Ukrainian society is anywhere near likely to acquiesce to. Because, in part, what are we, in that case, in that scenario, abandoning the people in the occupied territories to? It is a savage and brutal military occupation. It is a situation where people don't know from one day to the next whether their children are going to be stolen. It is a repeat of the deportations and enslavement that we saw in the middle of the 20th century. Who among Ukrainian politicians or anybody urging it on them would have the moral courage to say, yes, abandon these people once again behind a new Iron Curtain? And even then, uh, your second point, uh, do we actually trust NATO guarantees anymore? Well, in a, an era of a possible approaching Trump presidency, we should also bear in mind contingencies. Not planning for a dissolution of NATO because America doesn't have to dissolve NATO in order to undermine its entire premise of deterrence. All that has to happen is for President Trump to say, you're not going to turn up. So yes, we should be looking in Europe to a future which is self-assured and is not so dependent upon the United States as the underpinning of deterrence. And that too is a process that should have started long, long ago. Before I give Patricia opportunity to comment also, um, just to bring the latest public opinion that I've looked up before coming here from Razumkov Center in January already, so you can say after quite, you know, painful counter-offensive campaign and little success on the battlefield, 3.6% say they're willing to stop the war now. 13% uh, say they would agree to the pre-2022 line. So you think there's still quite a lot of fortitude to fight and we can discuss intentions of why is this the case. But Patricia and then to James. Just to, just to build on what Keir said, I think that you know one of the problems we would have with a, a territory in exchange for membership of NATO, et cetera, deal is that it's, it's, we're not there yet, certainly, and we may never be there. Um, and I would be very cautious not to try to do an end state deal. We've seen what happened um, post Crimea in the Minsk agreement. But we also, I think, need to understand uh, what Russia will be like once fighting stops. And if we see continual aggression, continu continual, then we, we'll know much more. That's why I'm quite, um, I'm not advocating any one position, but if, um, if I were to say, I, I feel most um, concerned about going to an immediate final state agreement or peace treaty, mm -hmm. just because of the situation that we're finding ourselves in, um, which is quite reminiscent, I think, of the late 30s in Europe. In some respects. Yeah. So, so on the question of how literally and seriously should we be taking Putin on this um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 1997 yeah. so the disengagement? Question, the question yeah. refers back to the December treaties of yes. uh, 2021 again. And I did mention that, you know, there's a, certainly a, <coughs> uh, a common view that they were designed to fail. That does make sense because it was so unrealistic. I mean, <clears throat> even if they weren't, even, even had we seen this, Russia would have gotten what it wants. So Russia won either way. Um, it was, as you know, amassing troops on the borders during that time anyway. But, uh, I mean, the, and there's a certain irony, though, because actually there weren't any NATO troops at the front, on the front line states until Russia annexed Crimea. It was only then that we put them forward, in fact. But, I mean, it, it's, it's, to be honest with you, it's, it's a purely, it's a, it's a hypothetical, and it's, it's, you, it's, you can't even consider it now because there's no way they would withdraw. But at the time, I mean, yeah, they were, I mean, it is quite, I mean, I think it was said at a time, even before the invasion in February, they were not treaties, they were ultimata. But again, we did not take that as seriously as we should have done. But I think also we can interpret it as the way of Putin's strategic objective is to break away this transatlantic, sure. if you want, sure. Truman Doctrine approach to security, what it is, what NATO was created for in 1949, exactly to you know, prevent uh, Soviet Union at that time to roll over Europe. It was designed Europe. to destroy NATO. Yeah, to, to yeah exactly. <laughs> So before I, I, I see lots of hands, just want to ask one question because that's an issue that, you know, is, is still being floated in the air. Alessandro Rosselli and maybe Natalie could take this one. What about a neutral Ukraine, but here's comma, internationally guaranteed? Would that be some, I mean, 
uh, <laughs> people, this is the, the reaction. I mean, we have an answer to that, but I, I think it's important to... Means. You don't know what that means. Okay, well, that's an answer. It's a good one. Um, but if you, seriously, if you want to read a bit more about this particular uh, dangers of this solution, we have this report, How to End Russia's War, in one of the chapters, which, of course, it's sorry for shameful promotion, is exactly why this is a dangerous pathway for, not only for Ukraine, but also for wider Europe. Uh, let's take more questions from the audience. I'll see the hand over there, and then, yes, the gentleman here, yes. Um, Charles Kings, were a student at LSE. Um, last year, late last year, um, the Latvian government put forward a proposal to spend 0.25% of GDP on aid to Ukraine and Estonia. suggests that um, Estonia. Estonia, yeah. yeah. Estonia or Latvia, um, <laughs> and they put this forward at the end of last year, and the idea was this would be 120-ish uh, uh, billion uh, dollars, and if the US were not to do it, it'd be about 60 billion. Um, and this would be enough to sort of maintain uh, NATO, uh, maintain uh, Western support for Ukraine. Would that be enough, and is that proposal realistic? Okay, that's a good one. And the gentleman here in the first row, and then, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Just introduce yourself, May, yes, sir. My, my question, is, uh, Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, Just introduce yourself. My, my, my name is Alberto Portuguese, and um, I I work against all uh, all wars in the world. Yeah. Uh, that is, I work for world demilitarization. Okay. Because, if you can just uh, ask your question because, because, uh, because there's because, lots of uh, hands. Because I lived seven years in Geneva yep. in close contact with the United Nations and with all departments of the United Nations. Yep. And I ended up after those years... Could you years please ask your question because there's so many calling, hands. ...calling the United Nations uh, International War Club. And I called the Security Council in Security Council. Okay. And uh, so I just wonder how do you think that politicians can produce such miracles, like promote a war industry and create peace at the same time? I find okay. it an oxymoron. Total, total. Uh, it's, it's the same as saying... Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. We understood the question. We'll take it back to the panel. Yes, the lady over there. Yes, yes. Thank you, Ksenia Gorova, Labor University. I was wondering, is there any thought that the world, and especially the West, uh, is not only dealing with ending the war, but also with changing Putin's regime? As uh -huh. Kier mentioned, uh, even if Ukraine receives a complete victory, uh, how long Ukraine and other countries will stay in peace if Putin's regime continues to exist? So basically, the new Russian democratic regime could uh, change so many issues, like immediately stop the war, contribute uh, to Ukraine, and reassure the rest of the world in the peace. So are there any opinions about different approaches to the Russia right now, like support and funds, for example, Russian opposition or anything similar? Thank okay. you. Will you take the James? Yeah. So maybe we'll start with the Estonian plan, because I know here you know it quite well. <coughs> then maybe Patricia on the UN, and then Russian uh, opposition to James. Sure, the Estonian plan, uh, which we can be quite brief about. The question is, well, is it enough and is it realistic? Well, the Estonians put a great deal of effort into explaining precisely how it would be enough and it would be realistic. That's the whole basis of the plan. They wanted to make it something feasible and not daunting for European states to sign up to. And the whole purpose of it was demonstrating how little investment is required to safeguard the future security of the entire European continent, compared, and they pointed this out really quite bluntly, compared to the much greater sums that the EU, for instance, has spent on anti-COVID measures, on energy subsidies, on paying people more when their energy bills are high, et cetera, et cetera. Compared to that, the figures that the Estonians are putting forward for their long-term plan for convincing Russia that its war is unwinnable, and let's not forget, this is not an immediate miracle solution, it stretches over years, are really quite small beer. It is less affordable if the United States is on board, but it is still perfectly feasible within European budgets. That's really the whole point of their plan. Okay. Um, so, conflict prevention, deterring conflict, deterring war is really important. And 
what's clearly happened here is that all of the prevention techniques that the UN has built up over many years and understood, all of the ways that we understand about deterrence have not worked, and Russia was not deterred from invading Ukraine and may, Ukraine and may not be deterred from invading others. So when that happens, the UN Charter is quite clear is that you have the right to self-defense. And that is what's happening now, is Ukraine is just defending itself. Putin could end this war by just reversing what he did, pull out, right? You know, unfortunately, you know, Ukraine's been forced into this situation and has to defend itself. Going forward, we have to rethink, it seems to me, our prevention techniques, our deterrence techniques. We have to understand much better what prevents and what deters. And we have to understand how much resilience we need to build in the system, how much funding we need for equipment, what would actually work to deter such a, a, an adversary, an enemy, that would just march in to your country over several years. This is not, you know, 2022 was not the beginning of this war, right? So we, we really have to understand that in order to really understand what prevents and what deters and actually reinforce what the international community um, has always been set up to try to achieve. That's the only answer I can, I can give to that. James? Yeah. Can I just say something very quickly on defence spending, sure. and I'll answer the question. But on defence spending, I just want to say that Russia is spending 7.5% of its GDP on, on defence, and, and actually an awful lot more, and an awful lot more on security, on security overall. And in fact, it's that which is fueling the Russian economy. So the war economy is, the Russian war economy is driving the war. So he's, he's in a situation whereby he can't stop because that would actually tank the Russian economy. And can I just say that actually what we need to supply Ukraine with isn't that expensive? You know, we've sure. seen the yeah, impact absolutely. of very cheap mm -hmm. uh, things like drones. We've yeah. seen the impact of very cheap things like ammunition. We, we, and look at the way in which Ukraine has been able to adapt an awful lot of systems. They don't even have to be like state of the art or anything like that, absolutely. the sort of thing that we're spending a huge amount of money mm -hmm. from. We should take some lessons from that. Yeah. Sorry, I, didn't, Jane. I, I didn't answer the question. Sorry. Yeah. But my, just my on book. spending, because, because I think it's an important point, yeah. and one of the, the, the kind of Russian narrative wants us to uh, believe in is that we are spending such huge amounts of money on, the, on, on Ukraine. I mean, again, in that report in June, we, we said the, the joint transatlantic community spends 0.95 percent of its collective GDP. And in terms of weights and technology and assistance, clearly, if Ukraine is backed by, by the West, Russia has very little chance of achieving its war objectives. But yeah, Russia's sorry, I internal... Didn't answer, I didn't answer the question. I, I'm sorry, I yeah. think that yeah, that, that, that. that is something as a constituent yeah. part to how this war will end, what will happen domestically in yeah. Russia, so, and how can we, in a way, support Russia to the right path as well? <laughs> can so, we? so first of all, I mean, you can get yourself into knots by thinking that, that we desire a change of regime, but we don't want to engage in regime change, and that, that does get a bit complex. But, um, but I think that what we have to remember is that any new post-Putin regime will not be lovey-dovey, lovey -dovey, touchy-feely, demo uh, liberal democracy. And actually, this is my this is my main concern that we bec that there will be so they'll leaders will want to extend olive branches to a new Russian leader, and that's when concessions that you may not want to concede may come in. And I, guess, I suppose that's my greatest fear. But uh, you know, and, and you know, even Navalny. Um, was, as we know, you know, actually uh, had nationalist inclinations, and he was not a, a Nelson Mandela a, a, of Russia. So I think we have to, I mean, and again, so I suppose, going back to the, we need to engage in evidence-based policymaking with a new regime and to understand who it is we are dealing with um, before you can come to any conclusions about what it is we may offer. Yeah, I just want to add that I think we have to keep in mind uh, the staying power of autocratic rulers mm -hmm. because unlike the, in democracies where a, in a misadventure like this will definitely cost you an office, here this is not guaranteed, not only guaranteed, but we can expect that Putin can survive uh, a serious setback and remain in power as long as he can provide benefits to a closed circle and uh, as long as the sanctions are not biting enough and he has those resources, I think there is a, uh, there is a big chance that he stays. So it might be even premature to think uh, about post-Putin. We have to think still now how to deal with this with regime. Putin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the question there. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Vanna Klimpursensadze. I'm Ukrainian MP. 
Uh, my question is uh, maybe first to Patricia. Is there any realistic reason to believe that Russian Federation would like to actually negotiate? Because uh, we from Ukraine do not see any um, any possibility that Russia would actually try to, to really negotiate anything but capitulation of Ukraine, and that's probably the only line that um, their uh, negotiation comes from. Secondly, um, uh, maybe to Kiev as well, you're talking about the disaster that uh, maybe bring the uh, Western political leaders up to the, um, to the task. Uh, every single day, there are quite a few disasters that are happening across uh, Ukraine. So I'm just wondering what exactly has to happen. Is it, uh, are we talking uh, something that actually brought the attention of the West uh, back to, to understanding, much better understanding back in 2014, what is happening on our territory when the MH17 was mm. downed by the Russian troops? Is that type of a disaster that you are talking about, that it has to be um, dealt with um, on the uh, you know, with the, with the citizens of NATO countries or EU countries. And third thing, maybe developing uh, the question with regard to Russian Federation, uh, is there any analytical thought uh, that is being put to the question here in Chatham House, um, what kind of Russia would we have to deal with mm -hmm. and that we should not be afraid of even um, dissolved uh, Russian Federation after the end of this war. Because it's not maybe even about exclusively about Ukraine's victory. It's about Russian defeat. And I have not really heard uh, the, the, you know, the, that type of line uh, here, because it's about punishment, isolation, weakening, and real defeat of the Russian Federation. Thank you. Well, thanks. It is great to have voices straight from Kyiv. So thank you so much for uh, speaking up. And over there, yes? Uh, my name is Andrei Buzarov. I am from Kyiv also from Kyiv, from Ukraine, right. but not MP member, foreign policy and expert. I have one question to uh, Natalia Sabanadze. Uh, as you know, as we know from the media, that soon President Zelensky will go to Armenia mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the March. And we also know that there is a high, very high probability that he visits Azerbaijan. And uh, we don't know whether he visits Georgia. So between yeah. Russian, uh, Russian troops in South Ossetia and between uh, Russian troops in Armenia, there is Georgia. So how you personally um, uh, an, uh, analyze and you personally, your personal opinion about the probability of the escalation uh, situation in the, in the South Caucasus in the next years? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Let's bring it back to the panel because there was a, a lot of issues on negotiations on what must, what, what, what has to happen for the West to mobilize and on what are we researching on the future of Russia. And then Natalie to you. Let's start with Kier and then go this way. As brief as possible because we are hurtling towards five, the end here. But the, the question Three briefly minutes. was we'll how bad does it have to be to get people to pay attention? Would it be MH17? I suspect it would have to be worse than MH17 because what was the result of MH17 beyond the Netherlands and Australia, the two countries most directly involved? Was that the wake-up call that was required? No, it takes more. Coming back to, the, to Estonia, the, what we have at the moment in um, downtown Tallinn is uh, billboards put in front of buildings showing the effect of Russian missile strikes. You see the building behind, you see what it would look like after it's been bombarded by Russian missiles. I would like to think that that would not be what is required for Western Europe to wake up. Of course, those are in Tallinn. They aren't the people who actually need to be told what the problem is. They live yeah. next door already. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, I mean, I think we know what it would look like. Um, and, and, you know, we do a lot of scenarios and game playing and everything, and the whole idea of that is to get people to imagine what things could be like. Um, so I would say, in terms of, I think it's a really good question as to what we get Russia to negotiate. And I, th I would say this, that Russia has already lost, right? It lost, really, in, at the end of February 2022, in which it did not succeed in its, its initial... Um, intentions, and it, ever since then, it's essentially been, you know, fighting marginal gains um, in, a, in a very brutal way, with a lot of threats, and you know, we don't forget all the nuclear threats that it made. But I think there there has to be a sense of worry in in Moscow about sustainability, uh, population sustainability, etc., because although autocrats, you know, can you know, move on and so on, but they, they still need some acquiescence of the people. I mean, we've, we've seen this, and they, they tend to like the idea that the people really love them, and um, they don't want to, 
to uh, sort of deny themselves that. So I think the sense of stalemate is really important. And for that, I think this is where I meant by you don't want to be, you know, Russia will only negotiate if it thinks that it can be in a situation, it could get worse for Russia. And, and Ukraine needs to also understand that in order to be able to negotiate. And if you were to be negotiating a long-term peace deal, that would be much more difficult. And that would take a long time as well. Whereas negotiating a pause or a stop um, can, can at least begin. And you can then start to see what might happen. Um, I would say as well, don't forget other countries in this. So, you know, we've talked about um, the various peace plans, but China's had quite a big impact. And China, I know, has, over, over the nuclear issue, what we've seen is a convergence of China, Germany, and uh, the United States to work um, together so that uh, Russia would stop the, the really quite terrifying nuclear threats that it was making. Um, and I think that we have some very interesting behind the scenes players uh, where Russia is highly dependent, it's not only China, but highly dependent on um, the, uh, the sales that it's making, be that energy, um, be that other commodities uh, throughout the world um, that you know, would like, probably like to see quite an end to this. So mm -hmm. that could be one of the drivers, um, but I might be grasping at straws at that point. Mm -hmm. Natalie, and then you, James. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, one of the reasons why President Zelensky is not visiting Georgia is because relations between uh, Ukrainian and Georgian governments uh, are rather frosty, um, as opposed to Ukrainian and Georgian publics. Um, Georgian government has uh, supported Ukraine in international fora, but it has been, it has done about, that's it. Uh, despite uh, great demand from the people to be more vocal and more supportive. Uh, it justifies it because of basically prudence, uh, saying that there is high level uh, uh, tensions, in particularly in the occupied <coughs> regions, and Russia might turn its attention there. And basically the message they're sending to the public is that we need to preserve peace at any cost uh, and, and promote development. Um, there is also a domestic political factor because uh, President Zelensky is seen as an ally of the current government's domestic rival, which sits in the prison right now, and the domestic politics has been trumping foreign political and national security um, interests, uh, unfortunately, in Georgia uh, lately. Uh, there is a risk of escalation, the one that I've spoken about, especially if uh, Georgian territory, or occupied by Russia, but still is used to uh, attack Abkhazia. But what I'm more worried about is this kind of slow, uh, incremental, uh, growing Russian influence on Georgia, uh, also uh, on Abkhazia. They're pushing now uh, foreign agents law in order to basically stifle any opposition within Abkhazia, which can be more pro-independent, um, and uh, growing influence of Russia on, on Georgia. Ukraine war will be, of course, uh, critical. It will promote democratic change, not only in uh, Georgia, but also all over region. Uh, and Ukraine can become a very important security uh, actor. Uh, Georgian-Ukrainian cooperation uh, under different government, I think, can be essential for changing the kind of balance and introducing greater stability in the Black Sea uh, region. All of this, in principle, is possible, but depends on a positive outcome um, of the war. Thank you. Yeah, so I would just say in response to Andrea's question that you can ask the Georgian president herself uh, yes. this time on Wednesday on this stage when she, when she will be here. Oh, and if you don't, I'm, I'm in your position in Arisio and I, I can ask her. Um, in terms of Ivana's question. And, and it will be live streamed, I imagine. So yeah, you can exactly, also see yeah, the answer exactly. to the yeah. question. Um, in terms of Ivana's question, Ivana, you've always been a good friend of the program and Arisio's Ukraine Forum in particular, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of the future of Russia, well, um, yeah, as you would expect a Russia and Eurasia program to do, but it, 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 but its long-term future is one of absolutely one of our key priority areas. We began to work on it last year. Uh, Duncan Allen produced a paper. Its conclusion um, was that in the event of Ukraine getting more or less what it wanted, 
um, then actually we would be dealing with a deeply resentful Russia, and it would it would be it would be as troublesome. Um, I don't like to use the word nettlesome. It actually it's underplays it, um, but it would be as difficult um, an interlocutor um, uh, as as ever. So it's so don't so. A, a, a Ukrainian victory, more or less, would not result in easier relations with Russia, as it was the conclusion. Yeah, and then I think that's something we also see with our interaction with policymakers, is that the thinking has, has started about what could be the strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but it hasn't really penetrated much of the thinking. And I am apologizing, I cannot take so many questions from the audience. You want just to finish, yeah? I just want to, uh, for us to end, just for a moment, just to remember all the people who've been killed and yes. injured yeah. in this terrible war. And, and at the last it's, it's important you mention this. And as we close, I would like actually to bring in the uh, words of Volodymyr Akulenko, who has been killed. He's been a Ukrainian writer who lived in Izum, who was occupied by Russia. The city was occupied. And he uh, was writing a diary as he was under occupation. Uh, before he felt the risk to his life, he buried it in the glass jar in the garden under the cherry tree, so archetypical Ukrainian. His father knew why it is. He told it to his friend, Valeria Amelina, who was also killed. But his words um, in, in this diary, one of the entries said, you can get used to anything. What matters is what sort of person you are left at the end of it. And of course, Ukrainians are now, in a way, victims of it, their own resilience, getting used to this horrible war. But I think the message from Ukraine, the way I see it, is that we can come out as a better world out of this if we do the right things today. So I would like to thank you all for following what is happening, for engaging, for acting, for um, uh, coming today, and would like to thank the panel. And uh, you can rely on Chatham House to bring you more analysis and research uh, about this um, Russo-Ukrainian war. And um, keep in touch with us. Thank you so much.